All right. Thank you, Phil. It's uh, all you. Thank you. I really appreciate the initial um, phone call that you gave to invite me to do this. I've, I enjoy sharing this kind of information. Right, recording. I've been doing it for a long time. Um, the focus has really transferred in the last 10 years or so in my industry from building networks and supporting them and fixing things that are broken to much more of a proactive cybersecurity, how to protect your company data, because there's tons of companies out there that do um, the building of the networks and the fixing of computers and all that, but there aren't as many out there that are very proactively really trying to help everybody that they come in contact with, whether it's home users or business users, with protecting the data, and it's becoming critical. I mean, there's so much information out there um, I read an article recently, and it was it popped up in a number of different news feeds. Um, there are something like five or fifteen billion accounts compromised. I, in my, I think it's fifteen. Um, and even though there's not, that's like an outrageously big number. It's because over time, more and more data gets gathered and gleaned by the hackers through a various number of methods that we're going to cover here, and they're dumped into different databases on the internet. And that area of the internet where the data is kept is called the dark web. So one of the things I don't think I really included in the slideshow today, so I'll just touch on it before we get into the slideshow, is the dark web. And it's a, it's kind of a generic name for areas on the internet where hackers go to either buy data that's been stolen from people or to sell data that's been stolen from people or to look for utilities and tools that will let them compromise people. So hackers are actually out there not as much writing malicious code, but they're actually going out there and they're buying pre-made data stealing applications for fairly little money so they can run their own phishing campaign. So it's becoming more and more important for every user to know the basics. And so in order to fit into a fairly short session, I've kind of gleaned down the information that I normally present at a full blown like seminar into kind of more of a, an abbreviated one that's focusing specifically on the four or five best ways that home users can protect their data. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll kick up my um, PowerPoint presentation. All right, so can everybody see that okay? Yes. All right, so let me go into the slideshow. There we go. Okay, so this basically cybersecurity basics or cybersecurity 101, protecting your personal data at home. Um, it's especially been prepared for, for the folks, the members of the center. Um, and once again, I really appreciate the fact that I'm having a chance to present this information. I'll be glad to share you know, the slide deck with you when it's done. And then if I, once, once I get a copy of the uh, recording, I can put it on my YouTube site and you'll have it on yours. So share the information. Um, I think one of the things that may make this uh, an appealing presentation is that I understand the fact that not everybody speaks geek. Not everybody understands the complex terms. Um, I'm not here to try to sell anything, so there's no sales pitch here. This is just, if I had 30 minutes to, to talk to a cousin who came in from, from the other side of the country and say, look, here's what you need to know to protect your data, this is kind of the information that I would give them in, in plain English. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the, the first frame. Um, so cybersecurity threats, there are four main areas that they come in. Um, one of them is in the form of viruses where you get infected you download the wrong program, you go to the wrong website, you get a code on your computer that is specifically written to do bad things, and that's basically all the term when you hear malicious code or a malicious application, it's code that was written to be malicious to you and your computer, it's, it's there to do bad things. So malicious code um, is basically what viruses are. Um, hackers are the people out there who are trying to get your data through a number of different methods, and we're going to cover those. Um, there are identity thieves out there who are specifically going not just to steal information generically so that they can sell it online, but specific, specifically so they can become an identity thief and go out and conduct transactions as if they were you, such as buying stuff online as your name, filing for social security, as you trying to claim your tax returns, that's what an identity thief does. And then there's spyware, and spyware, which is a little less typically aggressive, um, 
than viruses. It's just it's, it's software that slowly gathers on your computer and it slows the computer down. And it's, in some cases, it's doing some nefarious things. But in most cases, spyware is just junk that accumulates on your computer, like a coupon, a coupon program. That's one of the more popular ones. And then you install it. And the next thing you know, every time you're browsing the internet, your computer is trying to take you to a website that you didn't want to go to to sell you something that you might have shopped for the week before. So that's what spyware does. Um, so, um, so I see. All right. So this is a scenario, um, phishing scenario. Uh, it is a pretty cut and dried, standard-looking phishing email where somebody is saying, "Important security notice due to a risk in security breaches on in industry." Congress has mandated high information security standards. And basically what this phishing email, which is a very popular type of phishing email, it's trying to get somebody to provide their password. It wants their email password, or it might want their login password to a website, or you might get an email that says it's from Wells Fargo, and we feel that your account may have been compromised, so we need for you to, to, to verify that you are who you are. Please give us your username and password. You'd be surprised how often those kind of phishing things work. Um, so remember to be suspicious when you get an email that you weren't expecting. Um, what are the tells in this email? So some of the tells are the subject and sender. Um, so the message is very generic. It's from some person called system administrator. So you know, Mr. and Mrs. Administrator had a child they called system and that's who's sending you the email. Um, and then it comes from an email address, sysadmin at it-securitygroup.com. Once again, businesses get easily confused because the employees don't always know who the vendors are. But this is the type of thing that I would tell an employee, if you get an email like this, just talk to your network manager or your, or your business manager, and he'll let you know if it's legitimate. Um, and so once again, sometimes this email address part is not visible. You just see who the name is. But if you hover over it, you'll see the actual email address this totally does not look legitimate to me. So to say, you know, this would just raise my suspicion right there. Um, supposed authority. So this, this email has supposedly been sent on the authority of Congress. So they're trying to cite some national authority that's saying you really need to do this or you're going to get in trouble. Then they're asking for a password. So that's three tells in a row. Subject and sender supposedly coming from an authority. They're asking for your password. Um, and then spelling and grammar, you know, in this case, cooperation, you know, that's technically there's no hyphen in cooperation, but usually I will tell you the typos and the grammar errors are much worse than that. I had one client a number of years ago who got infected with uh, ransomware, ransomware, their entire network. Um, it was before they'd signed up for some of our more advanced phishing screening simulations. And the email literally said, pleasing to look at my resume. And it was like, it was the grammar, it was so bad. And one of the temps who worked there opened it. And so unleashed malware on the entire network. So somebody, somebody who shouldn't even been interested in somebody else's resume because they didn't, they were in no position of authority, opened an email they shouldn't have and infected the entire network. And fortunately we restored it all from backups, but you know, the tells are very common. Um, now this is an example of a real phishing spam that was sent by one of our sent to one of our clients that then forwarded it to me and said, "Hey Phil, do you think that this is legitimate?" And I didn't really have to think twice. I mean, I looked at it, and if you look at the sender's reply address, it supposedly came from MSN-Docs, but the email address associated is Natalie at ypas.org.uk, and I happen to know that .uk means it's from it's from the United Kingdom. Um, or it might be the Ukraine. Either way, the email address was not legitimate. Um, and if you look at the link, when you hovered, when I hovered over the link with my mouse pointer, it actually went to this website, which obviously does not look like a shared Microsoft OneDrive folder or anything else. I mean, it, it just smells of suspicious. Um, and if you look at where that, so being the bold person I am and knowing that I have tons of protection on my computer at work, I clicked on the link because I wanted to see where it was going to take me. And as soon as I clicked on it, I got a screen that said, that warned me because we have protections in place. And it said, this is a deceptive site ahead. And it's telling me about the website itself and that I may be entering into dangerous territory. This would have given me the ability 
to go beyond it. I could have clicked on details. It would have taken me to the website. May or may not have been infected at that moment. I may have been asked some more questions because I was already falling for it. But the bottom line is phishing and malware protection is turned on by default in Google Chrome and most browsers. So the main lesson on this one is don't turn it off. You can go in and you can manually disable those protections. But this alone, if the client had clicked on that link, they would have seen this and they would have known that it was bad where they were going. So once again, the tells on phishing emails are pretty obvious. They're, that Phishing emails are the number one way that clients and home users get infected, get compromised, get hacked. You get an email, it doesn't make sense, or it looks compelling, and you click on it, and you open it, and you go to a website that you shouldn't, or you fill out a form you shouldn't, and the next thing you know, your data is all over the internet. So phishing, we're gonna, I'm really focusing on phishing because phishing is the number one way Phishing is how the, the DNC got compromised back during the Hillary Clinton email debacle and all that. That all began with a phishing email that got somebody inside of the DNC's email servers. It was a phishing email. When Target got hacked a number of years ago, it was started with a phishing email. It wasn't a phishing email to somebody at Target. It was a phishing email to somebody at the HVAC company that, that's, that, that provides HVAC services to Target but because their HVAC systems had a system that connected back into target servers, they were able to compromise target because of the HVAC vendors. So I cannot stress how dangerous phishing emails are and you really just need to keep an eye out for them. All right, so the other most popular way that we see people getting compromised, because I said I was gonna kind of do the highlight of, um, very, very popular method here. If you look in the left-hand column on my screen, um, there's a little, you see it says sponsored. There's a little ad that was on the sidebar window of some other website that says Douglas is gone, 72, basically implying Michael Douglas had died. Now this was like from three or four years ago and I happen to like Michael Douglas. So, you know, I looked at it and I realized immediately that if I didn't know better, I might've clicked on that because it's like, well, Michael Douglas is gone. Now, it was easy enough for me to confront that that wasn't true because all I did was popped open a Google window and I typed, is Michael Douglas dead? And immediately a bunch of responses said, no, don't be fooled by this, by this popular malware that is out there telling people that Michael Douglas has passed away. He's fine, he's grooving, he's doing his thing in LA. But I mean, anybody who clicked on that could have easily been taken to a website that would have gotten their information just because they were curious. So don't get curious. Always look for the word sponsored in the corner of one of these little news populations, publications, because they're usually they're not true. And the other most popular way that people get snookered online is they will cruise to a website that has been infected and they will get a warning, like the one on the right-hand side, Windows virus warning, identity theft and hacking possibilities, your computer has been locked. Most of you have probably seen this kind of message at one point or another. Sometimes it'll say, Hewlett Pack Packard is warning you. Uh, sometimes it'll say Microsoft is warning you. You're, I will tell you this, you're never gonna get a pop-up on your screen from Microsoft that says you've been compromised, please call this number. And if you call that number, you would get a hold of somebody who did not sound like they come from the United States, basically saying, this is Microsoft, I need to connect into your computer because you're infected and I'm gonna fix it for you. And then they would ask you for a credit card number, and then they would actually remote into your computer. And while they're talking to you on the phone, they would be in the background using software to steal all the data off of your computer. And I hate to say this, but we have computers come into our repair shops on a fairly regular basis, meaning every month or two. And it's in, in one time, it was actually a, an, older, an elderly lady who had literally had like her life savings wiped out of her bank account because she got this pop-up and she called the number and they remoted into her computer and they got her banking credentials and they basically sucked all the money out of her bank account. So this isn't a cautionary, this might happen somewhere. This actually does happen. So, if, and, and the other thing they do is they'll call you out of the blue. My mother who's 86 years old and doesn't even have a computer has gotten several calls in the last year from supposedly from Microsoft saying, we would like to connect into your computer because we've detected virus-like activity. So if somebody calls you up out of the blue, says they're so-and-so, they want to connect into your computer, don't do it. All right, so now we're going to hit some quick practices for um, Wi-Fi protection because I think most people have 
taking a computer out, not everybody, but I'll take a laptop out with you to Panera Bread or to the Fashion Square Mall, <coughs> downtown mall, you connect into public Wi-Fi. I'll cover some basic rules of thumb for using public Wi-Fi. Um, I lost my chat window, just in case anything was up there. I don't see it, but that, that's all right. I'm not gonna worry about it. We'll catch it at the end. There's um, no chats so, at the moment, so. Okay, all right, so best practices for public Wi-Fi use. Nothing of value, meaning if you're out at a public Wi-Fi hotspot connected in, don't do any online banking, do not do any purchases from Amazon, just don't. If you wanna read the news because you're bored and you're waiting on your coffee to arrive, or you know, perhaps you wanna check your email and just see who's been trying to reach you, but don't do any online purchases, banking, or anything else where you're gonna be actually typing credit card numbers or actual valuable information into it. Um, make sure you've got a good antivirus protection on your computer and that your firewall is turned on, and we'll cover that in just a second. Um, stay secure, use all of the best practices that we're covering during this seminar, this webinar, to protect yourself, so be suspicious. Um, and that's our evil <laughs> hacker woman. Um, and a personal VPN never hurts. A personal VPN, such as ExpressVPN, NordVPN, CyberGhost, private VPN, a vast secure line, there are bunches of them. What a VPN, a virtual private network does, is when you launch the software, it then initiates a session from your local computer to the internet service, like let's say it's Norton VPN. So you go to Norton VPN, it establishes a secure encrypted channel, meaning that anybody seeing the traffic, it would just be gog gobbledygook. They wouldn't be able to see anything. And then all of your internet activity, internet activity comes through that channel. So for example, if you go to Google, Google's website, you're not going from your computer to Google's website. You're going from your computer to the remote VPN server to Google's website, which means all of the traffic between you and that website is being, is being encrypted. So if somebody was sitting five feet away from you with what they call a packet sniffer and looking at data transfers going on with the public Wi-Fi, there's nothing that you're doing that they can actually see is going on. So that's really good protection. Um, moving directly into social media, we have a number of different social media websites that are more and more and more being used to compromise people's data. Some of it is through pure, um, carelessness, meaning people are posting information about themselves online that can then be used to compromise them. So if they give you their full birth date and they give you their full home address and they give you their, their phone number and they tell you what their mother's maiden name was, I mean, some people give all the information, they give away the keys to the kingdom online in their social media profile because they want to sound like they're being friendly. Well, these hackers may actually contact that person and post a message and say, oh, I knew your cousin Vicky over in Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> and she and I had a great time going out having coffee. Can you remind me what her birthday is? You know, just, it's weird, but that's, they're getting more and more clever. So be careful when, of the information that you post on social media. Um, make sure you're using long and complex cat passwords, meaning not like password one, two, three, or your, or your name as the password, try to put something in there that's gonna be difficult for people to, to hack. Um, share only what is necessary. Um, remember that you have apps on your phone, so you can get an app on your phone that then says it needs to link to your Facebook profile, and now you've got, you're walking around with a phone that is seeing everything that you're doing on Facebook, and maybe that is where the information is making it back to the internet. So don't install apps on your phone or your computer that you don't know that you need. Don't just install them for the sake of installing them. Keep it, keep it to a minimum. Um, and then go online and actually look at your social media accounts from time to time. Even if you're not posting regularly on Facebook, if you have a Facebook account and it's active, um, then go online, log into your Facebook account, and just look around and make sure that somebody isn't out there posting obnoxious or malicious or offensive material. That happens very frequently where the people trying to, you know, get negative information or propaganda out, they will hack somebody else's Facebook account and then start posting things that are going to be offensive to people. So just go online. If your Facebook account has a bunch of horrible stuff on it that you didn't post and you've been compromised, you need to change your password. Um, and this back in 2018, so you can tell the, the core slides from this are a couple of years old, 
but Facebook had announced on 9-28-18 that 50 million user accounts had potentially been compromised using stolen view as tokens. And I don't want to get, because I promised I wouldn't get technical, but there's a permission that a Facebook user can give to other users that's called a view as so that somebody else, like if you wanted somebody else to be able to manage your Facebook account on your behalf, you might give them the view as permission. So Facebook had a security flaw in the view as permissions and the hackers were able to get into 50 million Facebook accounts. And what they do is they harvest that data, they get the user accounts and passwords and personal information, and then they turn around and they post it to the dark web and now it's for sale. And sometimes it's as cheap as 50 cents, 20 cents per credential to get your credentials. Um, and this would happen not because of anything you did wrong, but because of a flaw in Facebook. And that's why it's so important, even if you have secure passwords, to fairly regularly go back and change them at least a few times a year so that if your password gets compromised on any of the accounts you have online, if it's out there for more than 90 days, it's gonna get changed anyway. Because a lot of these hacks happen because somebody got your password two years ago from a data breach, but you never changed it. And so two years later, they buy your credentials, they're still valid. It would be like changing the locks on your house every three months. The chances of somebody getting an old key and getting into your house become practically nil. So that's most of the social media. It's just be aware of your content and make sure that you're not putting information out there that is gonna compromise your identity. Um, online buying and selling. If you're buying online, you wanna be looking for the lock in the upper left-hand corner of your browser that shows you that it's a secure website. Usually you will see HTTPS up there in front of the website. Sometimes you won't see the S because Google, for example, Google Chrome drops the HTTPS out and this shows you the name of the website with the little lock in front of it to show you that it's secure. If there's no lock, the website is not encrypted. Anything you do that is, is potentially exposed to the general public. Um, and then there are known and trusted symbols on websites, but anybody can cut and paste that little picture there and stick it on their website and pretend that they're safe. So what you wanna do is, if you, especially if you're doing a financial interaction, an online purchase or something, if you see a logo that says McAfee Trusted or Microsoft Trusted, click on that because instead of just being a picture of the word trusted, it should actually take you to another website that shows you that the website has been secured by McAfee or by Norton or something. So be careful because anybody can use that picture and, and make it look like their website is safe. So you wanna look for the lock and you wanna make sure that the site is trusted and uh, be very careful when you're doing stuff online and buying from anybody you don't know. Um, selling, I'm gonna skip through it really quickly because I don't know how many people sell online. This was for business presentation, but always make sure your transactions are encrypted. Always make sure you're using proven technology. So you're using stuff that your bank has provided you for processing orders. Uh, and if you accept credit card payments, um, you need, you are legally obligated and morally obligated to keep that data protected, to not write it down and store it anywhere. You either need to encrypt it and then destroy it, or you need to keep it in a physically secure location. So those are the basics of buying and selling online. Um, and it's never a bad idea. To, I, I've done this plenty of times where I've actually gone to a website. I've gotten ready to buy from them. I had a little inkling of doubt to make sure that it was legitimate. I picked up the telephone and I called them and had a conversation so that I could feel comfortable that whoever I was doing business with was not some sort of a scam artist on a fly-by-night website. Um, if I wanted to, I could fire up a website tonight and be online tomorrow and look like I was selling things even though I'm totally not legitimate. It doesn't take any, there's no advanced credentials to create a website. You just buy an account and you pay for somebody to host it. So anybody can have a website. Phil, we do have a couple of questions. Do you wanna take them now or do you wanna keep going? No, this is a good time because then I'm gonna kind of run through, we're already getting into like home stretch where I'm doing an overview, but okay. this, this is a good time for some questions. Awesome. So um, how do you set up a personal VPN was one question. Every brand of VPN is going to have its own instructions. So like NordVPN will be different than GhostVPN. Um, when you, the main idea with these companies that are selling these VPNs solutions, which typically cost anywhere from 5 to $10 per month for the subscription, is they want it to be incredibly user-friendly. So normally what will happen is you'll go online and buy, let's say, a subscription to NordVPN. 
it'll you'll get a confirmation email with a link to download the software and 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 a, and a, and a, a registration key. As soon as you install that software, it'll pop up a wizard that will walk you through. It's usually three or four clicks, and you're done. And then it'll give you and then it'll give you tips, basically saying, so please remember that every time you launch your browser, unless you click otherwise, you're going to automatically be connected to the VPN. So there, there's no magic to that. But each one of them is going to be different. Uh, in my case, I connect into a VPN from home. It's to my work to our office at, at, in Charlottesville because not only do I want to get to the data there, but I want for all of my internet traffic to be encrypted on that channel. So in my case, yes, there would be very specific instructions for installing it, but all of the generic end user, um, general publicly available VPNs are all super simple, very straightforward. A wizard walks you through it and it's done. That, that's all there is to it. So you just, uh, you, uh, can you give us a few names of VPNs that are- Sure, let me, let me see if I can backstep a couple. Let me go back this way. Here we go. Yeah. So there's ExpressVPN. There's NordVPN. Um, there's CyberGhost. There's one called Private VPN. A vast secure line. Um, God, there's so many. Norton mm -hmm. has their own VPN. Um, Nord is probably one of the more popular ones. That's the one I hear. I think Nord and ExpressVPN, but NordVPN is definitely one that's been out there one of the longest. And I think it's reasonably priced. I think the, the, back in the day when, the, when, when private VPNs were, were less available, you might pay as much as $15 or $20 a month. But when everybody in the world got in on the bandwagon of selling VPN services, it really drove the price down. So it's supply and demand. I think generally speaking, you can get something for about $5 a month. That's great. Okay. Well, thank you for that information. Sure. Um, something I didn't say initially, but... Um, uh, this is more geared towards uh, PC users. Um, yes. And we got the comment, um, very important, um, that this information is, is slanted towards Windows PCs. Um, to This person said, do not use antivirus software on a Mac. Macs have X-Protect software built into the operating system that protects against viruses. Would you like to comment on that? Okay, first, I will make a disclaimer. I'm not the Mac guru in our company. Uh, Robert Yo is the manager of our Charlottesville shop, both shops. He's retired military. He's old school Mac. It's not since the beginning of time. Um, as far as I know, there, what I've seen in the last couple of years, even as recently as like a month or two ago, is there are more and more compromises happening to Macs. I mean, I, I see them. I, I've done a couple of blog posts on it and all that. And my goodness, I just saw one. I, I could swear it was last week. Um, I would not say not, I, as far as I know, the, the built-in protection for Macs is not bulletproof. And none of these are. None of the protections you can get out there are. Um, but there was a long, long, long-standing myth that Macs could not get virus infected or compromised. Um, that one got blown out of the water about five, five years ago. I'd say about 25% of the computers that come into our shops for virus infections are Macs. I don't work on them. So I'm out there doing business computers and Macs are not that prevalent in like the, the normal business office workplace, but I probably would defer. I, I'll, I'll make a note to ask Bob about Mac virus protection because I also don't want to, to mistakenly say no, Macs mm -hmm. are incredibly vulnerable. I just know that there was a point in time up to about five years ago where you almost never saw a Mac come into the shop needing a virus repair. And all of a sudden it's become much more prevalent. And I think it's because of this mistaken idea that Macs are still like bulletproof when it comes to viruses. I, and, and I know they have built-in protection. And in, and in fact, um, Windows computers have for many years had, had, Windows, had Windows Defender installed on them by default. And for many, many years, Windows Defender was considered to be like really poor, weak, crappy antivirus. So we were installing a vast antivirus on any computer that came to the repair shop that didn't have a third party antivirus on it. But in the last 18 months, my team has now told me that they think that Microsoft or Windows Defender is as good as, as like a vast free. So mm -hmm. I know that things have gotten better on the PC side as far as what comes out of the box. I can't speak authoritatively on, on the Mac one, but I will put that question to Robert Yeo. And one, I'll, I'll try to get an answer back and I'll send that to you along with the, the slides. Perfect. So that you can have, because he would, he would be the guy to know. He works on them. 
He knows what the protection is. And if there's a preferred protection, he'll let us know what it is. It may very well be that what the Macs come with out of the box is just good, but I don't want to say that without knowing. Sure. And we have a couple of really, um, what I would call high-end expert Max folks on this call. So um, maybe towards the end when we're doing discussion Q&A, if um, they want to share any more information, that would be helpful too. Yeah, um, absolutely. absolutely. There's, there's another person said, uh, remember VPNs are not for antivirus. Correct. Right. So a VPN is a virtual private network, connects you to the internet. It, it, it encrypts all of your data. Not the same thing as an antivirus, which is software that's actually looking for malicious code that's trying to infect your computer. Um, so you could actually be on a VPN connection and get to an infected website and download an infected file and totally get like infected and all during the course of being in the middle of a VPN. So a VPN is a virtual private network. Antivirus is literally software that looks for suspicious activity and code on your computer. So that is correct. That's a great, uh, that's a great distinction. And I appreciate that comment um, here uh, because I don't know if I would have thought of that myself, you know, because it's, you talked about four separate things and, but they interact with one another. So yes. um, another um, comment, Comcast Xfinity seems to provide some level of VPN just judging by the fact that the websites think I'm accessing from a different location. I also have Nord VPN. Does keeping both on, is, is, does that, is that redundant? And or is there any harm by using both at the same time? No, no harm in using both. Xfinity does provide some little level of identity masking so that you're not easily identified as far as where you're connecting from. That's mostly so that when you go out and you see an Xfinity connection at somebody else's place of, of business or home, and you can connect into it, but your location is being masked. But no, if you look at the slide that I have up on the screen, there's multi layers of protection that, that an individual or a business can put into place to protect themselves. And no one of them is the end all be all. If you, if you can have a really good antivirus and a good web blocking, web filter blocker, like Viper internet security is really good. It's got a, a bad website blocker built in. So if you've got a good antivirus and a good website blocker and a good VPN solution, you still need to have your personal firewall turned on. You still need to be using safe passwords. You still need to be following the rules of protocol for social. Like the more layers you can put in there, the better. Um, I'm actually working on writing up, I'm hopefully it'll be a book at some point called Breachless. And my wife's, when I told her the name it was gonna be, I said, well, I said, she said, well, why, why wouldn't it be breach proof? I said, nothing's breach proof. The United States government isn't breach proof. Fort Knox isn't breach proof. Nothing in the world is breach proof. If you have enough hackers focusing enough energy, they can breach anything. But what you can do is promote a company to be breach less, meaning in the entire life of that organization, they never have a breach. So I want everybody to be breachless. That's, that's what we're going for. And the more levels of security you can layer on, the better. Now, the one place that that does not apply and it's counterproductive is you never want more than one antivirus running on a computer at a time. So if, for example, if you have McAfee antivirus, you do not want to also have Norton 360 running and Avast running. Because what happens is all of the different antivirus programs will be looking at everything you do simultaneously and it'll bring your computer to a complete crawl. So if you have a computer that's running particularly slow and creeping, you might just look through your programs that are installed and make sure you don't have multiple different antiviruses installed because that will kill performance in a heartbeat. Hmm. Lots, lots to take in. And um, along this issue, would you, uh, you know, I know as a Mac user, I get frequent updates, you know, mm -hmm. update your software, update your yeah. software. Yeah. Um, and I've been told by my Mac guru, it's always a good idea to, to do those updates. Um, does that have anything to do too with uh, security, whether you have a Mac or a PC? Absolutely. So, yep, the number one thing on my list, which the next screen was about, was installed. Oh, well, heck. <laughs> so, yes, so updates sometimes called patches or security patches or fixes. Um, we're no longer for Windows 7. It's retired, so you can't, get when, you can't get Windows 7 patches. But Windows 10, the Mac OSs, keep in mind this was written a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> you can get security updates for your operating system. You can get security updates for your applications. Um, the 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 double-edged sword that you run that you run on when you do Microsoft updates is every 
couple of months, Microsoft releases bad updates and they will do bad things to your computer and sometimes cause it to crash. So for example, today is what is called Patch Tuesday. It's the Tuesday of the month that Microsoft will release its patches. As a managed service provider, we never push out Microsoft's updates the day that Microsoft releases them because we want to wait at least a week to make sure that other people's computers aren't crashing before we put them out to our clients. But as a general rule, yes, if your antivirus says it needs an update, install it. If your operating system needs an update, install it. If your applications, anything that needs an update, because the reason for at least half of the updates that are being put out is because somebody detected that there was a security vulnerability in the program. And so the, the, right, the authors of the program wrote a patch to fix that vulnerability. So, and most computers, as I've mentioned here on the screen, um, are already configured to download and install updates by default. So just don't, not turning that off and not clicking later. I mean, that's, that's the biggest sin that I see when it comes to updates is I've gone to clients, new clients that we pick up and, and they'll be clicking later and later and later and later and later. And I'll say, wow, your version of Adobe Acrobat seems to be about nine months out of date. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, it keeps prompting, prompting me to update it. And then I keep saying later. It's like, well, what does later mean to you? I mean, you know, at some point that vulnerability is going to get compromised. So that's, it's important to get those. And then also to make sure you're restarting your computer once you install updates, because my, for example, with windows computers, the updates don't get applied until you reboot. So that, that's an important thing. Well, I, and not to have it be the Carolyn show, but I have definitely been a sinner when it comes to the later, later, later. And it used to be with my Mac, I couldn't remember my password. <laughs> so when they, <laughs> you know, that was always the, the catch 22. It's like, oh, later. Oh, that means I have to find my password, blah, blah, blah. So, but I right. think it's gotten easier now. Well, and the, and the good news is as important as it is to get these security patches and updates, the bulk of the reasons why people get their computers infected and bring them to us goes back to the initial topic we covered, phishing emails and pop-ups, phishing emails and pop-ups. Somebody, they'll get an email that says, Microsoft needs to verify that you own this Microsoft Office email account please provide your username and password to, to well, that, that's a hacker basically asking you to provide you their credentials. So, you know, it, it's so, is it security updates important? Yes, but if you don't install them the day or the week or even the month they get released, you're probably okay, but you don't want to put it off indefinitely. A, a month is about as far as I can push it. Great, thanks. I'll let you continue. Okay. I know you backed up one slide or you went ahead one slide for me. Yeah, yeah, so uh, let me back up one. So yeah, so the quick overview, and, and we're not going to, this short blurb on each one of these topics we're going to run. So it's install the OS and software updates. Those are for security reasons. It's to run some form of antivirus software, and I will try to find out if the one that's built into the Mac is adequate or recommended by my team. And if not, I'll try to get what the recommended one is. So I got to make sure I get that. Um, preventing identity theft is a kind of a proactive thing where you're actually being suspicious of people that are asking you for information that you shouldn't have to provide or a pop-up that's asking you to call a phone number, identity theft, or somebody is just calling you up randomly out of the blue. Hey, this is Wells, you know, this is Wells for a bank calling you up saying we're calling you for credit card to verify a transaction. And we have a credit card transaction with so-and-so. Could you please give us the card number that goes with that transaction? Why don't you say no? Why don't I hang up and call the number on the back of my credit card? And I'll ask them about it because they'll tell you if it's a legitimate fraud alert, then you can call Wells Fargo, you can call BB&T, you can call Bank of America, and you can give them your card number and they'll let you know. But don't give your credit card number out to somebody who's just calling you up on the phone. Just, just, I wouldn't do it. Um, so prevent identity theft. Um, the same thing goes for social security numbers. Don't do that. Unless you know who you're talking to, don't hand that out. Um, make sure you leave your personal firewall turned on. Avoid spyware and adware, meaning know what to look out for, those free attach onto your computers, protect your passwords, back up important files. Um, and if we run through the numbers really quick here, um, updates we already covered. As far as antivirus software, you do want to periodically open up. Your antivirus should always be running in the background, but it's also on your start menu, whether you're running a, a Mac, a third-party Mac, antivirus or a Windows one, you can actually launch the software and typically you can easily find a button that says update. Just click update to make sure that you've got the latest updates for it. Um, for business PCs, most businesses 
have some company like PJ Networks managing their antivirus for them to make sure that all 20 or 30 or 50 computers on the network are all up to date. Um, we have found that a vast free antivirus is pretty good stuff. Um, Bitdefender free is pretty good stuff. Um, Viper is probably my favorite paid antivirus for Windows computers. It's V-I-P-R-E. That's what I use at home. Um, but make sure that whatever antivirus you have running, and Windows has a warning that comes up and tells you if you have no antivirus running, never ignore that. If Windows is saying that you have no antivirus protection running, you either need to click that button and turn on Windows Defender, or you need to download and put something else on, but don't ignore that, that's a biggie. Um, preventing identity theft. Uh, obvious stuff, I think, pretty, pretty self-apparent. Don't give out financial account numbers, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, or other personal data unless you know exactly who's receiving it. That's, that's called social engineering. Um, social engineering could also be you work at a company or whatever, or, or, or you volunteer for an organization, and somebody calls up and says, hey, um, Carolyn said that she wanted me to verify that everybody's got a good, secure email password with, with the center. Would you mind confirming what your email password is? You know, it's like, it doesn't matter if they know the name of somebody you work with or that you work for. If you're not sure who's asking you, then just tell them you'll have to get permission to give them that information. Um, don't send personal or confidential information via encrypt, unencrypted email or instant messages. Those can be easily inter intercepted. Um, beware of phishing scams. We've already covered that one in, in detail. Um, and once a year, it doesn't hurt to order a copy of your credit report. <laughs> if not from all three, because you can get one from each one of them each year for free, but at least from one of them, just to make sure that no totally unexpected, like you didn't know that you bought a car last year, you want to make sure that no unexpected transactions are popping up on your, on your credit line. Um, so turning on personal firewalls, there is a Mac firewall and there's a Windows firewall. The Mac firewall. Um, there is a, um, when I send the, the slides to you, Carolyn, those links will be live. Uh, but there's a link that basically walks you to through how to make sure that your Windows or your Mac firewall is turned on. And those links should come through as live links when I send you the, the slides deck. Super. Um, firewalls act as protective barriers between computers and the internet. Hackers search the internet by sending out pings to computers looking for random IP address responses. Firewalls can help prevent your computer from responding. When somebody says Marco, your computer will not say Polo if the firewall is working properly. Otherwise, somebody might be pecking at the door of your computer on the internet and your computer talks back and says, who's there? You just let somebody know somebody's there. So don't do it. <laughs> Use your firewall. Um, avoiding spyware and adware. And once again, even though a lot of these practices are more geared towards PCs, a lot of the stuff about social media, about phishing emails, all of those are totally legit when it comes to Mac. So, you know, I, I do apologize that this is mostly or primarily PC oriented, but the basic fundamentals of Facebook and, and online ads and pop-ups still apply with Macs. It just may be a little bit more difficult for the hackers to get to you, but if you respond to something that they're sending your way, they, they will have tools to get to you. So. Um, so spyware and adware do take up memory and can slow down your computer or cause other problems. Macs tend to be less susceptible and accumulate less spyware and adware than PCs do, for sure. Um, watch for allusions to spyware and adware in user agreements before installing free software. For example, if you download a free copy of Adobe Acrobat Reader, there may be this little pop-up that comes up and says, when you install Adobe Reader, you're also going to get a free version of, of McAfee Security Advisor. There's, an, there's the ability to disable that. You can say, don't install that. So be careful about the freebies because those freebies are exactly what we're warning everybody about, that spyware. Um, beware of invitations to download software from unknown internet sources. And we suggest using Malwarebytes Free or Hitman Pro for spyware and adware detection removal. Just found out, sadly, from one of my engineers in the last couple of days, that Malwarebytes Free, which has been great for years to recommend to people to download and use to clean spyware and stuff off your computer, the latest version will no longer remove it. It'll detect spyware, but it won't take it off of your computer. So it'll make you pay for a version to do that. Um, as far as I know, Hitman Pro still works well. Um, I'll try to see if I can't send you a little bit of information, Carolyn, on that as well, on, the, on something that'll take the price of malware bytes. Thank you. One of our um, 
tech savvy folks mentioned that malware bytes is a great spyware detection software so it's nice to get that update from you unfortunately that's the way yeah it's going yeah and that's kind of been my go-to for years somebody would call me up out of the blue hey phil i know you know i think i've got something minor going on with my computer how do i check and see if it's spyware or something i would just be to just google for malware bytes free download it run it click yes to remove everything you're good apparently i won't be able to do that anymore so that's unfortunate mm. Um, I have another question. Sure, if that's okay. Yep. Um, Jen, what is two factor? Some websites ask me if I want to enable it, but I'm not sure how it helps me. Yes. Yeah, so two factor is great. Two factor is the ability to run some sort of, uh, in most cases, what it's referring to is the ability to run an authenticator on your smartphone that turns on, that lets you use what's called two factor authentication. So that, for example, um, I've got a whole slew of them here. And I'm going to break major security rules, but see the numbers change every 30, every 60 seconds. But so I've got a program on my cell phone and there are seven different applications that I've got two factor six enabled to so that when I go, for example, to log on to our client management system called ConnectWise, after I put in my username and password, I have to go here and find a six digit number that changes every 60 seconds. And the only place in the world it shows up is on my cell phone. So I get logged into ConnectWise, I can then immediately go to my phone and type in those six extra digits, bam, I've got multi-factor. Even if somebody had my username and password, they can't get logged into my ConnectWise account because they don't have my cell phone. And so we use that for our client management, we use it for our computer management, um, we use it for our remote support software, um, we use it for our VPN. So every time I connect to my company VPN, I have a username, I've got a password, and I've got a six digit key that changes every 60 seconds. So once again, imagine how incredibly hard it would be for somebody to get into my VPN account without having my cell phone in their hand. And then if they did have my cell phone in my hand, they would also have to know my username and password. So typically two-factor authentication or multi-factor means somebody's got two different ways of verifying that they are you. And one of them is usually physical and one of them is usually a username and password. Um, so, so if I can I give an example like of, yeah. of a common way so I know um, with Comcast so I sign my username and password in and because I set up my account and said yes I want this two-factor authentication and I put my cell phone number in there yeah. after I put my name and password in my cell phone goes voo, voo, and I get six digits that come up on my cell phone it's pretty easy I don't yeah. even have to sometimes open the text it's right there and I see 66215 I type that in and it does, it makes me feel more secure because I'm the only one with my cell phone. And so, you know, when we've had a problem with that particular account in the past and we haven't since I've gone to that two-factor authentication. Yes, so while, and what I was showing on my phone was the Google Authenticator. Um, the easiest use to want you, the easiest to use multi-factors do go use a text, for example, most banking websites. If you sign up for multi-factor, they will do exactly what you said. You go to log in and like three seconds later, your phone will buzz telling you you've got a text and it'll give you a six or seven digit code. And without that code, somebody cannot get logged into your account. And the code expires after like 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes. So yes, anywhere that you, if you have a cell phone and you're capable of receiving text messages, when you get asked if you want to get multi-factor or two-factor authentication, just say yes and make sure they've got your current cell phone number and you've just made it tenfold more difficult for somebody to compromise your account. So very good point. Yeah, so. thank you. Yes, and someone else was uh, saying, you know, set it up for your bank account, brokerage account, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, all of those accounts, because especially the, I think Facebook, Twitter, those ones that people do try to get a hack into and can do that, it yeah. really does protect you. Yeah, and there, I mean, I'll be honest, there's some websites where I don't really care that much. You know, I mean, for, you know, like personal social media, well, other than the business website, um, social media stuff, but my, you know, there's some personal accounts I have. I don't care that much if somebody gets into my Yahoo account. I mean, what are they, they're going to read my personal Yahoo mail, which I don't use for anything other than stupid subscriptions I sign up for online. It's kind of, I call it a throwaway email account, right? I don't have multi-factor set up on that, but I absolutely do on all of my business related stuff and all of my stuff for banking. Everything's multi-factor. Um, and Duo is a third party app that you can use. It's like, it's like Google Authenticator where it actually is a program that runs, but the easiest to use ones are gonna be the ones 
And typically there'll be a little question mark when, for example, you go to your banking website and you go to set up your, and you set up your account or you, or you just browse and look for multi-factor and there'll be a question mark next to it under like frequently asked questions. And when you click on it, it'll tell you how it works. For example, you'll click on the question mark and it'll say, you will provide a cell phone number that will be texted a six digit security code every time you log in. Is it a pain in the butt? Yes, there's this old saying in cybersecurity where security is never convenient. The more security, I mean, I've got seven, six different things in Google Authenticator that I need multi-factor for. So every time I log in to those six different things, I have to stop and look at my phone and sometimes wait till the next 60 seconds comes around. Is that convenient? No, but on the other hand, I can't afford to get compromised. I'm a managed service provider. If I get compromised, my company could get compromised, which means my clients might get compromised. So, you know, if it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to go through multi-factor, I'm just saying, if you have the option to do it, do it. If it's something where you buy stuff, Amazon, if, you're, if you've got a credit card number stored there and somebody could go and buy anything in the world they want and have it shipped to them, turn on multi-factor. So, you know, and yes, thank you. That was a great question that came up and I'm glad we, we had a chance to hammer that home because it really does make it 10 times more complicated for a hacker to get into your system. Just to beat a dead horse on that one, yep. um, if I'm like, well, I don't even know how to set up two-factor authentication, what would you say to that person? Um, you know what? I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Google. So if you're using any kind of software that anybody else has ever heard of, I could, right now, for example, I could, I could go into Google, I'm sure, and Google for how to set up multi-factor Wells Fargo. And I will go to a website on Wells Fargo's web page on Wells Fargo's website that will literally show me with print screens how to set up multi-factor. So multi-factor, but it's gonna be different from website to website. In Amazon, it's one thing. On Facebook, it's another thing. Um, the easiest ones, like I said, that you're gonna to wanna to use are gonna be the ones where they just text you a code every single time. There are some that are even easier where you just get a, when you log into like your Google account or whatever, and you'll get a pop-up that says, it looks like you're trying to log into your Google account, press yes or no, and you just press the yes button and you just multi-factored yourself in. But Google Authenticator is a free app you can get from the Google store. And when, and so if you need to, you, yeah, it's, it's all pretty straightforward, but Googling is your friend because I can't tell you off the top of my head how you set up Facebook authentication. I'm sure if I went to Facebook, I could find out in 30 seconds, but if I Google for it, I will find how to set up multi-factor on Facebook and it'll give me a link that tells me how to do it. So Google is your friend. Another question on that. So yeah. I guess I wasn't the last one there. No, um, good. Good so stuff. what if you and your husband both use the account? Oh boy, I can relate to this. Can they yeah. send the two-factor authentication to both phones? Because you don't want to have to track down, you know, your person every time you want to order. Well, you know, I, that is a very good question. Uh, my gut answer is for most services, and it's going to depend on what service you're trying to log into. My gut feeling is no, because my wife and I have the same challenge where, for example, we both, we share banking accounts and we share business accounts. And what will happen is one or the other of us, usually it's me, my phone, I will get an authentication code. And if I didn't request it, then I'll forward it to my wife because I know, that, I know that she's trying to log into something that I would, that, that, and, and that the, the notification's coming to me. Now, I wouldn't say blindly do that. I wouldn't say just anytime you get an authentication code, uh, tech, forward it to somebody else. But I know when we share an account, I just know, or she'll text me saying, I'm getting ready to log into such and such. Would you please forward me the code? And then 30 seconds later, I have a code and I forward it to her. But I, I haven't seen one yet that'll let you put in multiple cell phone numbers so it'll simultaneously send to them but that was a good question and i wish i wish yeah with the authenticator app it's a little easier because kelly both kelly and i both have the app installed so either one of us can access any of those accounts whenever we want ah okay well that's a good advantage on the authenticator app i hadn't thought about yeah. great um anybody else any questions i'm i'm looking did I miss anybody's in the chat? I think I covered everything in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or Well, I'll comment. go ahead and hit the last three slides then. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were no, done. No, no, Please hit, go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> just basic common sense things about passwords. Uh, don't share your passwords. Make new passwords. Difficult to guess. Try not to use the same password. We're all guilty of this, I think, but don't use it a bazillion times. 
don't have all of your online accounts with the same username and password. The number one reason for that is you might have some very innocuous password. Like for example, if I use the same password for my Yahoo account that I use for my Bank of America account, if my Yahoo account gets compromised, my Bank of America account just got compromised. And those are the credentials that get sold on the dark web. It's a username and password combo. So everywhere you've used the same combination of username and password, if one of those accounts gets compromised, they've all been compromised. So that's why you want to use different. So you can use a password store like KeePass. I like, I like KeePass, LastPass is good. I think Max use Keychain, um, but try to make them unique, try to make them complex. Um, don't use common words like, you know, password one or let me in or baseball one. Change them periodically. That's like the number one. If, you, if you're changing your passwords a few times a year, you are pretty much doing about as much as you can to keep your password safe because people get, get, get hacked all the time. It's not your fault. Like Facebook might get compromised. You did nothing wrong, but now somebody has your Facebook username or your email address, more importantly, and your password. And it may be the same password you're using on, hopefully not, but on your banking account. So if you're changing your passwords every 90 days, then unless somebody gets their hands on those credentials when they're fresh and hot, which doesn't happen very often, you've kind of eliminated the chances or minimized the chances of getting compromised. Once again, it would be like changing the locks on your house every 90 days. If you have an old house key that somebody has from 10 years ago, they're not getting into your house with it. Um, different methodologies, the government has changed their recommendations over the years. Um, it used to be a minimum of eight characters and a mix of upper and lowercase letters and symbols. Um, but nowadays, it's be more and more and more, it's becoming use a long passphrase. So for example, the example I gave on the screen, I want to visit Denver in 2018 exclamation point um, with each word starting with a capital letter. Yes, I'm using common dictionary words in this, but it's extremely long. And if somebody was going to compromise that, they would have to be able to get all of those words in the correct order. So it's, and it's a passphrase that's easy, that, that was easier for me to remember back in 2018. So that was a temporary password I used. <laughs> but if you're going to do it the right way, the proper way, the recommended way, something like LastPass or KeyPass password safe or Keychain um, or an encrypted USB drive that you keep your passwords on, um, then that's going to be the way that you can keep a unique password. It's just the only, once again, security is never convenient. So if you're doing 20 different passwords for 20 different websites and keeping them in LastPass, then if unless you have saved into your browser, you have to look up the password when you're going to access it. But once again, it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, we find way too often people at, at, at business, um, business offices are keeping passwords under their keyboard on a post-it. I mean, if I was a thief and I wanted to break into somebody's office and steal somebody's password, the first place I would go is to their keyboard and lift it up and look underneath and see if there's a password there because a lot of times that's what happens. Um, at home, that may not be that big of a deal. I mean, you know, yes, you can still get broken into and get compromised at home, but in, in a business office where people come through and can get access, just keep it in a, keep it in a nice encrypted place. Um, back, okay, now this is probably the biggie for me, the end all be all, back up your important files. If you don't wanna lose data, this won't necessarily protect you from getting hacked and it won't necessarily protect you from getting compromised, but this is what's going to recover you if you get ransomware. There is no easy way to unencrypt encrypted ransomware files. And if every, in case everybody doesn't know, ransomware is when you download malicious code or bad virus code and it gets on your computer, it takes all of your Word and your Excel and your, your picture, your JPEGs, your photos, your QuickBooks file, not usually not QuickBooks, um, your PDF files. And it, what it does is it locks them with a code that is required to unlock them. It's, it basically encrypts them just like a security software would encrypt the files, but then you don't have the key to unlock them. And then the, 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 rant, the hacker basically requires that you pay a ransom in order to get the key to unlock your files, hence the name ransomware. And there have been some really big public um, ransomware hacks over the past couple of years, like where some hospital, it might've been Denver, I'm thinking it was Denver, it might've been the West Coast, but some, was asked for like millions of dollars, like one point something million dollars to get the encryption code back. 
and I think they refused to pay it and their IT support company wasn't able to recover all of their data back from backups because it wasn't all well back. They lost, they, basically, they permanently lost data files. But if you have a full thorough backup of all of the data on your computer, whether it's up to the moment up to date or whether it's just up to like the month up to date, at least if your computer gets ransomware, you can basically recover everything back to the last backup. If you have no backups at all and you don't pay the ransomware, which doesn't even always get you back your data files, then there's nothing that's gonna get it back. Every now and then we get lucky and somebody out there, the government will crack a ransomware code or somebody out there will, will come up with a, with a decryption key for an old ransomware, you know, from three years before. But if you don't get really lucky and you get ransomware and you don't have backups, then you basically can kiss goodbye to your wedding photos, the baby pictures, all the things that really you've accumulated over the course of your lifetime. If you don't have a backup and you get ransomware, you might lose that data forever. That's, that's sad, sad news. So backups, backups, backups. Um, keep your critical files. If you, the easiest way to back up is keep all of your critical files, your important stuff, in one place on your local computer's hard drive so that you can back up that one main folder in all subfolders. If you have the ability to encrypt the data using an encryption software, do so. But otherwise, at least get it all. Like in most cases, people on a Windows computer, it's under My Documents. And so as long as you're getting all of your My Documents files back up, you've got 95% of your data back up. Um, and store them in a secure place, like get a backup and then move that away to an offsite location if you can, otherwise at least the other side of your house, somewhere where if the house burns down, you don't permanently lose all of your information. Um, and then you wanna, once in a while, you wanna test recovery. I mean, if you're doing a backup to a thumb drive, every so often, every few months, just put the thumb drive in your computer and go and look for restoring one of your data files to make sure that it's actually recoverable. So that's pretty much, that's the main presentation. I think um, two-factor and multi-factor was mentioned on the final page. Avoid leaving your laptop unused or sitting in plain view in a public library. And do watch out for people looking over your shoulder, right? You know, that, that happens. Uh, set up user account and password. A lot of people don't even have a, a laptop that locks. You turn on the computer, it boots all the way up right into their desktop. And then if they've saved their passwords for some of their websites into their browser, You've just given them the king to the kingdom. So have a user account on, set up on your personal computer. Don't install unnecessary computers, uh, programs on your computer. Encrypt your local hard drive if you can with either BitLock or FileVault, depending on whether you have Windows or um, a Mac. Um, and then have your computer cleaned up and tuned up every three to six months, at least once a year, because sometimes this spyware will accumulate over time and all it takes is an annual tune-up to get it all cleaned up off of it. Um, that's about it. The last was this talk. Last slide was just talking about what a professional company like PJ Networks can do for a business environment. But since we're focusing on home computer protection, the next steps would be furthering your education. Look at what you've got going on based on everything we've discussed, and then do your best to make it a better, you know, a better environment for you. And then in the slide stack, you'll see a couple of links for free, uh, free resources. Uh, small the Small Business Development Center has a free website for data protection and education. And then there's an there's a organization called Cybrary, and those are free resources to go and get free information if you wanna continue becoming more secure. And I think that's it. That's the, so more questions? Yes, and thank you. This is really informative. Um, if your stuff is in the iCloud, does, is ransomware still a problem? Yes, uh, depending on if it's, if, if, any so that's a, and the same question comes up with OneDrive. If you have a live connection between your local computer, whether it's a Mac or a PC, and a cloud resource like OneDrive or iDrive, iCloud, then if it's a connection, that means if you change a local file, let's say it's a Word document or something, and as you're changing it, it changes in real time in the cloud, then yes, because as soon as ransomware encrypts all of your local files, it'll then replicate that up to the cloud. So if I have a Word doc on my local computer for my book manuscript and I hit a save button and then three minutes later I get hit with ransomware on my home computer, if I'm syncing to one to OneDrive, then within a minute or two of getting hit locally, the one in the cloud is going to get ransomware as well. On the other hand, if you're using the cloud to back up your files, like if you're backing up to iCloud using a backup utility or if I'm backing up to OneDrive using a backup program, then no, your files should be safe 
because your backup files will be an encrypted file that gets stored that cannot be accessed by the ransomware. So if it's a real-time sync, the answer is yes, it's not a good backup solution, but if you're manually running backups or it's running scheduled backups, then yes, normally it is gonna be a safe way to keep your data offsite. Carolyn, For example, a carbonite backup would not yep. be, a carbonite backup would not be subject to ransomware. I think Kate, Kath has a question. Yeah, just a quick follow up on that one. Let's say you have all your photos in Google Photos. Uh -huh. Is that, are they protected from the malware attack in that case? Yes, because my understanding is the way Google Photos works is you would not be having a real time sync. Um, your Google Photos is only going to update whenever you're manually pu pushing stuff to Google Photos. As long as it's a manual process to get your local files to the cloud, then those files should be safe in the cloud. It's only when you have automatic synchronization going on that you have a potential risk. But a lot of online resources, and, and so I'm not an expert on iCloud, um, but a lot of online storage things that do synchronization do allow you to turn on multiple revisions of files, and that's your safeguard. For example, on a local computer, there's what's called um, Now, a snapshot. So basically, Windows will do a snapshot image of your files. So you might have 10 different revisions of the same file. Bad news is ransomware can attack those local cache copies and turn it off. Basically, the first thing ransomware normally does is turn off your, your, your snap images, and then it will infect your files. But if you're keeping them in the cloud, then as long as you have control over the number of revisions, and you have at least more than one revision enabled, then you should be fine. And it's something to check with Google. I, I don't know about Google Photos, but you probably can just turn on a setting that says, I want to keep the last three copies of every file available, and the previous versions will not be accessible by a ransomware. Great. I, there's another question. Um, what is the security status of Zoom? Well, everybody may be aware, most people may be aware that Zoom went through some issues about, what, two months ago, was it? Um, maybe a little longer than that, where people were getting Zoom bombed and people's Zoom accounts were getting compromised. And it really kind of left a big, a bad taste in the public for using Zoom. And in fact, it was happening at the same time when we were deciding whether to go with Zoom or go to meeting. Um, I went with go to meeting. Plus the fact that, we, well, and go to meeting is made by Citrix and we're already using other Citrix programs. So it just made sense to add those on. And it was super cheap. I mean, $16 a month for a GoToMeeting account, you can't beat that with a stick. Um, but my understanding is Zoom fixed all those issues. And as so far as I can tell, Zoom is just as secure as GoToMeeting or any other online collaboration. And more so than a lot of these little third party apps. Zoom is a major, major power out there. So I can't imagine that any of the security issues that were, that were exploited have not been fully patched. I mean, I, 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 would, I would have great confidence in Zoom being a secure, as secure, not breach proof, but hopefully less breach prone. Great, thank you. I noticed some people have um, unmuted. Is that because you have a question? And if you do, go ahead and ask it. Yep, this is it, time for the free for all. <laughs> I think the questions have been great because they've brought up more questions and comments and allowed us to delve a little deeper into the information you presented. So I appreciate it. Anybody else, any more questions or comments? I have one for um, a Lenovo computer that has a uh, defender as a virus protection. Is it better to get, you know, McAfee or Norton and, and not use that? No. So like I said, if you, if you, if, Windows Defender for many years had a bad reputation because it just wasn't that good. My team now feels like if you're going to run a, a free um, protection software, which that one comes built into Windows free, um, that, that Windows Defender is good. It's good enough. It's as good as Avast free or whatever. If you were going to go for a paid, I've, I've never been a good fan, a big fan of, of McAfee um, or McAfee, however you want to pronounce it. Um, I've just had too many instances where a computer was, was running dog slow and you want to install it and all of a sudden the computer runs much better. Um, I've just never been impressed with it. That's just been my, other, other programs like Norton 360, for example, are very, very, very heavy because there's like 12 different components of the software. So you're really bogging down. 
if somebody wants a good paid antivirus, I can't, I can't recommend Viper any more strongly. It's what I use. It's what I have on my mom's, well, my mom's computer that she doesn't use, but it's what I put on there. And because you can go to Viper, if you Google Viper security or Viper internet security, I think the website is like threat track security. You can buy like a 10 computer household subscription for like a hundred dollars. It's a one year subscription and you can share it with up to 10 computers and they don't have to be in the same household. You basically get the software, a download and a license key that you can use on up to. In fact, it's what we recommend to a lot of smaller businesses that don't, that can't afford to pay for managed services. And we'll say if nothing else here, buy a 10 user license for this for a hundred bucks, we'll install it for you. And at least we'll know that you have a good solid layer protection. And it's and Viper will also scan for outdated third party software like Adobe or Flash Player or other programs that can be compromised. It actually does scans for that and it blocks malicious websites and it's got a good built in firewall. So Viper is great bang for buck. But if you were going to go for a free one, I think my team agrees that Windows Defender is, is good now. It's good stuff. Okay. Carol and I do have another comment. Yep. Sure. You mentioned at the beginning that we had a couple of Mac experts here on you know, listening in, and we lost one of them, but Clay's still there. He's my favorite anyway. Sorry, Tom. Um, <laughs> I wonder if he'd be willing to give us any comments that might be Mac, you know, specific that would help us out. Sure. I mean, we can ask Clay. Clay, what do you, are you, do you have anything you'd like to add, subtract, multiply, or divide? I'm turning off my screen sharing for a second, by the way, just so I can Google a real quick for some quick Mac oh, sure. security tips. Like I said, Google's my friend. There is Clay. Hi, Clay. Uh, well, uh, I would be glad to work with any of you individually. Uh, as Tom Cross said, uh, the malware bytes is a very good thing to do a check now and then. And I hadn't heard that they uh, don't no longer remove. I'll check into that. It's possible. But that's a temporary thing, and you may need just to update the uh, Mac malware bytes thing itself. Uh, other than that, um, the most of the uh, viruses that you've probably seen, or malware that you've seen, are probably the for the problem of the person, the user, who hasn't kept up to date with things or make those mistakes that you were saying they shouldn't make. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, it, you, I, I mean, you know, I get a physical every year. Why not take my computer in? I, I, I get lazy about it and I get angry when it doesn't work. And then by that time, it's probably pretty sick. <laughs> One other thing, Carolyn, of course, people can contact me, uh, go to the senior web center web, the center website and uh, or check the office desk. My email is available. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one help. So uh, I would be glad to work with any of you uh, on, on everything Apple. Yep, Clay is our Apple man. Thank you, Clay. Is that good, <laughs> Kath? Do you any, any other? There is another question. Yes. Um, it's, and it's one that I think is very important too. I'm receiving emails that have a name from my address book in the subject line. The message is a link signed by the same name as in the subject line. I've been deleting them, but how do I stop? them they seem to come from a variety of senders so normally what that means is that your is that somebody else's um computer got compromised their address book got stolen and that information got shared out on the dark web so there isn't any real way to stop them especially if they look like if they if they look but so you're saying it's coming from somebody who's in your address book that person is saying uh same name for my I'm receiving emails that have a name from my address book in the subject line. Is it the same email address every time? Messages and links, by same, signed by the same name as in the subject line. Um, I, think you've, I, I think you answered it probably correctly. Somebody else's that you know has been hacked in their email, therefore they go into their email or their, their computers and you are in there, your address, so they send you an email sounding, seeming like it came from that friend of yours and usually it's got some kind of advertisement in it. I've had that happen 
m several times, and each time I called the person and note to her, got a hold of the person that it seemed to be coming from, right. and of course they knew nothing about it, and right. I ple asked them to do the other thing, change their password on that email. Yep. So, okay. So to inform that person and tell them to change their password on the email. No, these are not coming from the person in my address book. Ah. They're coming from other people, a variety of people, I believe. The subject line just reads like Carolyn Mir. And then you look at the message and it'll be a link signed Carolyn Mir. I've been deleting them, but how do I stop them? If they have, if the person who's sending them illegitimately has your email address, you can't really stop them. This, this, and, and I'll just use a real life analogy to, to kind of put into perspective. My mother, who is now in a senior living facility in Charlottesville, for decades was a strong supporter in every nonprofit, you can, legitimate one, every wildlife federation, every Save the Native American, everything, she, every year, Twenty to fifty dollars. Every organization known to mankind would get a check from my mom, and so she gets three, you know, dream catchers and three blankets and all that. Several years ago, when her health declined, she stopped contributing to these people. None of them, like all of, she cut them all out. The only, the only place she gives money anymore is to her church. Um, I went and picked up her mail for her at her old house because we just got done selling it, and the course of two weeks there were no fewer than 40 different envelopes in her mailbox from different nonprofits, and there's no way that we know of to get off of their mailing list they've got her address well now we're going to be changing her email, her permanent mail address but the bottom line is unless you lose your existing email address you can't take your email address away from the people that are sending it to you and you can't stop them from sending to that address you, you can't do it I mean, you can try blocking each one of them individually, like using a screener. To We've say, been Don't doing that. Yeah, but I mean, but then it's going to come from a different location every single time. So it, it's frustrating, but, you know, some sort of a spam filter would probably be the best thing I could, I could say. Something that will screen out spam. How about um, calls from an unknown number where you don't know anybody that are coming in repeatedly on your cell phone? Hmm. Same number over and over or yep. different? Well, I, I think we all get, I get those too. Um, and because I'm a business owner, I get a lot of solicitations. Um, I typically, I mean, honestly, I'll, I typically ignore them. In fact, well, you know what? Actually, what I do is I've got an option on my Android phone to basically block it and then mark it as a spam call. And then I don't have to take, then it won't bring the call to me anymore. I do get worried when I see the number trying to call me repeatedly. And at some point, I will normally answer it. And if it's somebody I don't want to talk to, I'll just be pretty brusque and say, look, I never gave you permission to call me. Why are you calling me? Please take me off your list. And then I mark them as spam. But there's, there's not much you can, you can do about that, unfortunately. I mean, I think Congress just passed a new law trying tightening down the restrictions of what spam solicitors can call um, telephone numbers because it was getting kind of lax again. But, you know, once again, these are, these are the woes. The biggest concern is if your email address is floating out there for random strangers to email to, then um, as Clay was saying, somebody out there has probably published your email address out to some spam, some dark web databases, and people are getting them for free. They're getting your email address and just sending it. What are, what are the nature of the emails that you're getting? What are the nature? It's just a link. I've never clicked on the link. And okay, subject line, I'll use Carolyn Smith. Yep. The message, the total message will be a link signed by Carolyn Smith. Can you do, it sounds like you're looking at one right now. No, I'm not. Oh, they come gonna, in so frequently that oh. I've I, got them. I was just going to say, now you've got me curious. If you forwarded it to me, I, I would, I'll, I'll take a look at it. And I'm very good about hovering and figuring out what it is. And then if it's still got my curiosity, I'll click on the link because I've got like seven layers of protection going. But I do, I have to open the re emails regularly for our clients because not every one of the emails that come in looking funky like that are not legitimate. Most of them are not, but some of them are legitimate. And somebody at the other end just doesn't know how to use good grammar or good protocols. So somebody will send an invoice. I've got to look at it and give it approval. But um, What's your email address? 
Um, you can send it to Phil, P-H-I-L, at pj-networkswithans.com. Phil at pj-networks.com. Next time I get one, you'll get it. All right, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to the bottom of that. Thank you, Phil. Sure. No, uh, no, I, no, I do want to mention, uh, it's totally fine if people have to go, and it's great. We blocked off two hours, and I'm happy to stay, and these are great questions. And so, But please don't feel like, oh, I have to stay if, if you need to go. Um, a quick note for the, for the Mac users out there. Um, so I did, like I said, Google's my friend. I did a quick Google. Um, I will do a quick, where's my sharing button? So let me share this. So I just did a quick uh, Google search for, security tips for Mac users. And I found what looks to be from Norton actually, um, 25 <laughs> Mac security tips and settings. And they just basically run through the gamut of, you know, locking down your computer, setting up your Safari privacy settings, all of the, all of that with a quick, with a quick Google search. I'll even, um, I'll, I'll even try to post this over in the, uh, if I can get back to the chat window. In the chat. It seems to disappear every time I click on sharing. There we go. Yeah, so that, that looked like a nice little uh, hit list of security things. Thank you. Yeah, covers everything from multi-layer firewall security to encryption to your app. Actually, this one was one of the more detailed ones I've seen. I'm going to actually email a link of that to myself because I want to, I like to, carry, <laughs> I like to carry a little backup plan for people that hit me with unexpected questions. I can just refer back to this article and have all the answers that I need. Super. Um, Sunny, you had a question? Yes, uh, I do use Dropbox and I have access from several different uh, devices, yes. including the phones. What kind of precautions um, do I need to have? I have a pretty good security, layered pre pretty good security on my PC, but I'm just realizing that um, I have some weak, weak links the two biggest things you can do with Dropbox, especially if you've got it access set up for multiple devices, one, have a really good secure password that changes from time to time, like mm -hmm. at least twice a year. And number two, multi-factor authentication, turn on multi-factor. And that way somebody has to have your cell phone or your mobile device to get into it, you know, whether from a computer or from a smartphone, whatever. But yeah, especially if you're keeping important docs in Dropbox, you got to be careful. Um, let me see. Um, uh, multi factor. Multi factor. Dropbox. Yeah, I had it set up. So uh, if I go to a new device and if I try to access my file, it will ask me, uh, you know, what's your what's the code and stuff like that. But I was just wondering about day-to-day -day operation because uh, things are constantly backed up to, um, to Dropbox. Yes. So like I said, two, I would say a secure password, two-factor authentication. If you do that, that's about the best you can do, but I would change the password at least a couple of times a year. Okay. Um, but Thank I, you. Yeah, so th and this one is... And I always like it when I can find easy step-by-step -step instructions. So this was a nice, easy page that I found. I'm sharing okay. to about basically how to set up Dropbox multi-factor. Thank you. Yeah, and it's not like multi-factor is the end-all be-all, but it, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, because even if somebody gets your password and your username, they can't get in unless they have your mobile device. And the chances of them stealing that are probably relatively slim, so. Great advice. Um, I'm thinking I should take down those. Um, well, just to reiterate, if you want um, Phil's presentation sent to you, uh, just send me an email, carolyn at the center, .org. And if you can't remember that, you can just call the front desk and say, hey, I was on that call, put me through to Carolyn and then I'll, I'll get it to you. All right, yeah, and I'll get that slide stack out right, right to you as soon as we get done with this meeting. Yeah. Any other burning computer questions for Phil? 
or comments. Doing all right there. Just looking to see. Yep, looks like uh, no more questions are coming in. No one's muting, but thank you so much. That was really helpful. Um, I just can't wait to get home and tell my husband to change his passwords. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, the two things that everybody should walk away from is if it's been a while since you changed your passwords, please just go ahead and change them. I mean, even if it's for no other reason than you haven't done it in a while, even if you don't think there's anything suspicious going on, mm -hmm. because I, I tell you that we have a dark web scanning service that we provide to our business clients that looks for their data popping up on the dark web. And sometimes hmm. I will get an update telling me that one of our clients has login credentials that just showed up on the dark web from a breach that happened three years ago, like the Equifax breach. Hmm. There, there, I, we st I still get notifications from people that were compromised on that, which means that their data is just now making it to the dark web. So if they've changed their password at least once between now and when Equifax was breached, they're fine. But if they never have, then somebody now has their credentials. So wow, wow. Just can't, can't emphasize that strongly enough. Yeah, that's quite the cautionary tale. And, yeah. And then, and then multi factor. Like I said, all you have to do is go in and Google how to something, how to multi factor for blah, whatever you want to do. You will find some easy to find instructions. If anybody has any questions, I'll type my email address in here. They're welcome to, uh, to email those to me. And, uh, but, uh, but I'll send the slide stack directly to Carolyn so that she can distribute it. But if somebody has any direct question for me, they're welcome to, to send it to me at phil at pj-networks.com. And if uh -huh. I don't know the answer, I'll do my best to get it. Like I said, I'll do a little bit of uh, digging about to find out what the latest word is on Mac's uh, built-in um, security software. Thank you so much. And uh, people are saying that in the chat too, very helpful and understandable, so. All right. Yeah, and I'm always, uh, 